Number 22, The God of the Bible, Chapter 6, Continued. Why did Jesus have to die? December 2021, John Pauline. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to continue with the God of the Bible. Why did Jesus have to die? Gail will offer our opening prayer. Father, we come to you this morning, not because we have a lot to offer, but because you have everything to offer us. We accept that openly and honestly, and we're just so pleased that we can unite with you. We are many people, and this morning I understand from a number of lands, but because you love us, you make us one. So, Father, we're just so grateful for your love you have given us, and we ask that this session will be all about you, that our minds will be intent on learning and knowing you and loving you, and it just be one more step in our journey to being ready to meet you. In your beautiful, loving name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. All right, we're continuing the sixth in a series on the God of the Bible. This will be the second part of the sixth, which is why did Jesus have to die? And in the first part of this, we noticed that the death of Christ was necessary. It was somehow very, very critical to God's plan. We then asked the question, why then is the cross necessary? Why did Jesus have to die? And have not yet gotten to answering that question, but we noticed that we were entering the topic of the atonement and that in the New Testament, the word atonement appeared only one time in all of the New Testament, and that was in Romans 5. And that caused us to look at Romans 5 and also a couple of parallel passages in 2 Corinthians 5 and Ephesians 2. So Paul is basically using a Greek word that has the sense of reconciliation and the idea of bringing people together. And this is why atonement, atonement was created as a word. So a number of interesting things there. We completed Romans 5 and 2 Corinthians 5, but are still wanting to look at Ephesians chapter 2 as another place where Paul talks about this central concept of reconciliation between God and the human race. So let's go to Ephesians 2 and verses 11 to 16. And once again, Terry, I think, why don't we read all six of those verses, 11 through 16, and then we'll go back one by one and pick up a few details. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances so that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. All right, so here we see, like with the Romans 5 and 2 Corinthians 5, we are dealing with the issue of reconciliation. How does reconciliation happen between God and the human race? You have an original situation of deep and intimate relationship, which was broken by sin in the Garden of Eden. And as a result, there was alienation between God and the human race. There's hostility between people. And Paul is particularly tackling the idea of hostility between human beings in this passage. So let's go back to verse 11. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. All right, so Paul here gives us a little window into some early church tensions. Apparently, 
Instead of talking of Jews and Gentiles in the church, the preferred terms were the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And I have to imagine that this was probably not always positive. It may have been a, a bit more you know, derogatory at times in how these labels were used. But these were the labels that were flying around in churches that Paul was familiar with. So you have a division even within the church between these two. It's interesting. It goes all the way back to the very beginning, because in Acts chapter 6, you have the Hebrew widows and the Greek widows, and there's tension there. It seems like the apostles are not being even-handed in distributing food and resources to the widows, that the Hebrew widows are getting a larger share than the Greek widows was the accusation. So even within the church, the ideal has always been reconciliation with God, reconciliation with one another. But the reality is that sometimes even within the church, it's not fully completed. So let's go on and see what Paul has to say about this. Verse 12. For that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. All right. So Paul here looks back to the condition that the Gentiles were in when they were not a part of the church. And so these labels are labels that should not be there in terms of the church itself, but they uh, certainly were used and applied when the Gentiles were outsiders. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. All right. So blood of Christ then is the basis for drawing them near. And we'll get in more deeply into why that is the case. But somehow in the blood of Christ, somehow in the cross, the Gentiles who were separated, who were outsiders, have now been brought near. And even more, verse 14. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. All right, so there was a situation of hostility. This is the consequence of the fall, that human beings are not only alienated from God, but they are hostile to each other. We see that hostility in history as we look at all the wars throughout uh, human history that were fought back and forth. And while those wars are often precipitated by leaders of various countries, the leaders take advantage of the natural hostility between people to stoke a situation in which war becomes acceptable. You saw that, of course, in Nazi Germany, where there was a certain latent hostility between Jews and Christians within the country and throughout Europe, and that was exploited. Here's a threat, a deep threat to our way of life. And people were brought on board to do actions that they would probably never have wanted to do themselves in most cases. This idea of a dividing wall is an interesting one because that brings to mind to the temple. In the temple, you have the temple building itself, and then there's the outer courtyard, and beyond that was the court of the women. So Jewish women were not allowed into the temple complex itself or even the outer court of the temple complex, but there was a special court for Jewish women. Jewish men then could go all the way into the temple itself. And some speculate, I don't want to gross anybody out, but some speculate that one of the reasons for this is that you couldn't tell if a woman was a Jew. There was no physical difference. But with men, you could tell. And so only circumcised men, men who were truly and unalterably Jewish, would be allowed into the temple complex itself. And outside of the temple complex, including the court of the women, was a wall. And on the wall, there were entrances, and there were repeatedly signs that basically said that anyone who is not Jewish who enters here will be held responsible for his own death, which will quickly ensue. I was privileged to actually look at that inscription. The, I think the best preserved copy of it is in the Archaeological Museum in Istanbul, Turkey. 
and you can see the stone where that inscription was made. So Paul visualizes the temple where the Gentiles were outside. But now Jesus said, there's no more this mountain or that mountain, but we worship God in spirit and in truth. And that transforms the place of worship from a particular building on this earth that has walls around it and threats to now anyone, anywhere can worship God in spirit and in truth. And that is a result of what Christ did on the cross. And the consequence of that is these old separations, these old hostilities no longer apply. That reconciliation is not just between us and God, but between us and other people. Verse 15. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, so that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. Yeah, here Paul kind of steps out of our uh, understanding just a little bit, because he's describing how this reconciliation took place, and he says that God did it by abolishing in the flesh of Christ the law with its commandments and regulations in order to create one man out of two, thus making peace. This has been a controversial text. And one also for Adventists, because there are many people who said, look, you know, the law of commandments is abolished. So the Ten Commandments no longer apply. I think it's pretty clear that's not what Paul intended here, because in many other places he cites the commandments and indicates that continuing in their obedience is part of what Christians do. But here, in some way, this abolishing of this law of commandments and ordinances creates one new man in place of two. And I think the best explanation I can come up with for what Paul was actually trying to say here is that this is like the replacement of the temple with spiritual worship that we just talked about. It is now here also saying that what matters now is not the outward forms of worship. It doesn't matter what building you go into in order to worship. It doesn't matter your worship style. It doesn't matter whether you circumcise or not. It doesn't matter whether you sacrifice or not. It doesn't matter whether you wash your hands or not. It doesn't matter whether you keep Passover or not. In other words, that's what this law of commandments and ordinances seems to mean. And there are many scholars who are not from a Seventh-day Adventist background that would take the text that way. It's a difficult text, but I think we can bring it into the larger picture by saying that many of these religious peculiarities were intended by God to be revelations of himself, and they became instead, in the hands of the people, revelations of how we can make ourselves superior to others or different from others. And Paul says, now that the cross has come, it no longer matters. What matters is a heart commitment to God and a heart commitment that leads to reconciliation between human beings. That, I think, is what this text is pointing to. And if any of you have a better explanation, I'm happy to include that here. Let's read verse 16. And might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross thus putting to death that hostility through it. So the point that I think is super critical for us is this, that the cross in some way provides reconciliation, which is the New Testament equivalent of atonement, of atonement, of bringing people together, bringing God and people back together, and that this happens at the cross. So we can say safely, I think, at this point, Why did Jesus have to die? In order to bring people back to God and people in harmony with each other. How it does that, we still don't fully know. What exactly is the process by which this happens? That we're yet to take a look at. But what's clear here is that both Jew and Gentile, this dividing wall is broken down. They are brought together. And they're, of course, then poster children for all the reconciliations that we need today. This is the great reconciliation of Paul's day, abolishing the hostility, making peace. So Paul here in Ephesians 2 is not focusing on the cross, 
He mentions it several times in passing, but he's focusing on the outcome of the cross, and that is peace, restored relationship, something that needs to happen in the church. Instead of simply labels, recognizing that everyone that has come to Jesus Christ is to be seen in a new light, in a new way. So Paul here has three texts in which he discusses the idea of reconciliation. I think one thing we have clearly seen, reconciliation is not something that happens to God. Reconciliation is something that God provides and that we are invited to enter into. All right, so let's go to number four in our handout. And in number four, it says, if the cross was necessary, how does the New Testament explain that necessity? We know that the cross brings reconciliation, but how does it do that? How does the New Testament explain all of that? That's what we get into now. And I say here eight different ways. Let me stop there for a moment, because if you go to the literature on atonement, and the different ideas of atonement that people have drawn from the Bible or from theological, philosophical thinking, you'll find anywhere from five to 20. There's a lot of different answers to the question, why Jesus had to die? Why did I come up with eight? Well, the criteria were this. I decided to include as major theories of the atonement in the New Testament. It had to be that that model had to be mentioned by at least two different New Testament writers. And by that, I would include Jesus. In other words, if Matthew and Mark both have it, but it's just a saying of Jesus that they're both repeating, that's not a second voice, right? So it needs to be two different voices, two distinct voices in the New Testament, both use that particular model of the atonement. So that's a way to narrow down the field a little bit. And I found that there are eight different models of atonement that are offered at one point or another in the New Testament. And so what I've done here is give you eight pairs of texts, as you see below. It says, how does each of the following texts explain why Jesus had to die? So there are like eight pairs of texts. Remember a voice from each part, from two different parts of the New Testament that give a certain model. So what we will do is read those groups of texts, just one at a time, and talk a little bit about the model. And I invite you, as you read those texts, as you hear the conversation, what does that model tell you about God? What can we learn about God's character from that model of the atonement? What does each of those explain about why Jesus had to die? So uh, two questions there in a sense. How does each model explain why Jesus had to die? And what does that tell us about God? All right, ready to go? All right, number one, we have 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and John 1, 29. So Terry, why don't we start with 1 Corinthians 5, 7? Clean out the old yeast, so that you may be a new batch, as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. All right, so here in this text, he's talking about bread without yeast. That's Passover bread, matzo, as we might say. So he's got Passover on his mind here in this text. And then he goes on to say that Christ is the Passover sacrifice. So in the Egyptian story, As the Israelites were about to leave, God asked them to sacrifice a lamb, take the blood and put it on the doorpost, and that would protect them from the angel of death that was coming in the context of the 10th plague. So you have Christ as a Passover sacrifice. So one of the models of atonement, you know, why did Jesus have to die? Because a sacrifice was needed. John 129. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right. Here, it seems clear that he has Isaiah 53 in mind. You have that amazing story about the suffering servant who is like a lamb taken to the slaughter. And most scholars think in John 1, again, the Passover lamb is in mind that the Passover becomes a model for the atonement here. 
So what do you think of this? How does sacrifice explain what's happening at the cross and what might it tell us about God? Why a sacrifice? We don't do it today. Sherry? Sacrifice can be in a lot of different formats. The whole sacrifice of Christ coming from heaven, even when we weren't asking to try to explain something, to try to show something better, to try to reveal the truth in a way that we could see and hear. I think that was a tremendous sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That's very good. I would point out probably you're using sacrifice in a slightly different way than Paul is. Both of them are very much part of the English word and may well be part of the original. But here it's talking about an animal that is killed. And Jesus was killed on the cross. And in both cases, blood was shed. So what? how does the concept of sacrifice apply to the cross? Terry? What comes to my mind is sacrifice, something dies. And then I link that to God saying, if you sin, you will die. And Satan coming along and saying, no, that's not true. You won't die. So in my mind, I link those two, but I'm not sure if, that's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. So on the one side, if we broaden the concept of sacrifice, we can see that sacrifice was definitely involved in everything that Christ did. On the other hand, when you're looking at the raw act of sacrifice, and I think anyone in the first century reading this text would associate this comment with the Egypt, first of all, and then the sanctuary service that followed. And the reality is God asked for a lamb, and that lamb was slaughtered, and the blood was put on the doorpost, and then there was a whole system of sacrifices. So that lies behind when Paul brings up sacrifice, when John brings up sacrifice. You have that whole context in mind. How is that helpful to answer the question? You can also talk about some of the challenges of that metaphor. Iris? Well, when we think about that original context, Israel enslaved under Pharaoh's strong hand, it was abundantly clear that they were in a helpless position and that the way Pharaoh responded to God's admonitions through Moses, he would not willingly let them go. (laughs) So Pharaoh basically in his rebellion and his resistance pushed God to the ultimate intervention, which was announcing that every firstborn in Egypt had to die. So at that point, because of the location in which the children of Israel were, they were at risk also of losing their firstborns. And by faith, as an expression of trusting God, slaughtered the lamb and put that blood on their doors. So that basically God's judgment of liberate would not have an adverse effect on their own household. So what I'm taking away from the Passover metaphor is for God to rescue us (laughs) because of the nature of Satan, because he does not give up anything where he has a foot in the door. (laughs) It is a bloody war. It is a bloody sacrifice. And It is really the level of rebelliousness that pushes God having to go to these emergency measures and at the same time showing us that he can do what is humanly impossible, which is a wonderful life-giving message for anyone who feels like they are trapped in the bondage of sin. There's no hope for them to ever get out. No, it's a lie. It's not true because of the blood of Jesus, God can set us free. Thank you. Very powerful. All right. So sacrifice is not a metaphor that we would choose, I suspect. But one principle we must always keep in mind is that God meets people where they are. One of the stunning experiences of my life was being at En Gedi, in the neighborhood, the Dead Sea. And it's kind of a cool place because you have water a cool rushing water, waterfalls there. So there's water somewhere in the desert that comes out at En Gedi. So it's a really refreshing oasis with beautiful trees and animals and so on. But you climb up into the dry hills above and you find a temple. 
and the temple has two apartments and it has a fire pit outside. And I'm looking at that and say, wow, that looks like the Hebrew sanctuary. And I asked the archaeologist, what's the date on this? And he said, 3000 BC. And suddenly it hit me. God meets people where they are. There may be a model building in heaven, just like the sanctuary on earth. But it seems very much also that God was modeling on what was available in the ancient world. When you look at the temples in the ancient world, a lot of parallels with the Hebrew sanctuary. So God was meeting them where they were. And some might suggest that the temples prior to the Temple of Moses were recollections of things that God shared with Adam in the Garden of Eden. That may well be the case. But the reality is that in giving them the model of sacrifice, God was operating with something that they were familiar with. And what would it tell them is the question. Would they see a magical power in these sacrifices? That somehow, if you do this sacrifice, magic happens and now you're reconciled with God? Is that what it's saying? The challenge with the sacrificial system, you go to Leviticus, and I challenge you to read it through. Not easy reading. Many uh, attempts to read the Bible have foundered in the middle of Leviticus, of course. But you will find one single theological statement, and that statement is the life of the flesh is in the blood. But you read through Leviticus just saying, here's the sacrifice that's required, here's how you go about it, here's who's supposed to do it, where they take the blood, and so on. And it's just listing all these kinds of things. doesn't explain them. So the sacrificial service somehow restores relationship with God, but the Bible doesn't explain how or why. And I think that the best answer is that the power of sacrifice was in God's provision. God said, here's a basis on which we're going to relate to one another. And if you respond to me by trusting my instructions and carrying them out, a relationship will be restored, even though you have been rebellious and sinful and so on. So one metaphor of the cross is that like the initial sacrificial system, it restores relationship because it's the provision that God gave. Obviously, sacrifice can lead you in some dark directions. So it's not a model we would likely generally put front row center in the world today. Larry. I'm assuming that every family had lambs, except maybe for some super poor people, but it was a predominant thing in that with every family, there are children. And I know from living on a farm with my grandparents, and they had some sheep and baby lambs, they were really cute and fun to be with. And now I'm going to move forward into the roughly the mid-1950s when Walt Disney did a movie called Bambi. And the year that Walt Disney did the movie of Bambi, even my brother, who ultimately became a hardened hunter, would not let my father go shoot Bambi's mother the next year. And the records are that hunting permits dropped dramatically upon the release of Bambi. So if, if that was the case from just a simple movie with no physical contact, if my brother and I have physical contact with the lamb that my father has to sacrifice, do you think maybe that we as a family are going to somehow be touched with the solemn event that's connected to that and that it's going to have an impression upon us that will cause us to pause and think things through just an idea. So I hear you saying the power of the sacrifice is on the impact that it will have on us. Yeah. And I'm not sure, I can't think of anywhere in the Bible where it makes that connection, but I think that is certainly a useful connection. And it reminds me of my wife's experience as a small child befriending a cow that was in the feedlot part of the ranch. And of course, the child doesn't know what a feedlot is for. And so they befriended this cow. They called it Tammy because it was just love to be with the kids, love to be touched and stuff like that. And one day, Tammy wasn't there anymore. And in the midst of a meal that included some beef of one form or another, my wife-to-be piped up, Mom, whatever happened to Tammy? And her mom virtually choked on the meat <laughs> and later admitted that they were eating Tammy that day. But it was just a horrific experience to even consider that possibility for my wife as a child. So I think the idea that sacrifice has a power with us can be one attractive way of addressing it. 
Let's go on to the next one, and we'll look at Mark 10.45 and 1 Corinthians 6.20. So let's do Mark first. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. All right, so here the death of Christ is described as a ransom. Why did Jesus have to die? A ransom was needed. 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. All right. So we were bought with a price at the cross. So the idea of a ransom, the idea of purchase is quite frequent in the New Testament. We noted here from Paul and from Jesus, the use of that term. In the Bible, the language is grounded in the Exodus story also, along with the Passover sacrifice, that God ransomed them from the land of Egypt and brought them out. So that's where that language kind of came from. But in the Bible, there's no indication to whom the ransom was paid. So that's been a real challenge for theologians, for scholars. If a ransom was needed, who got paid off? Was it God who got paid off? Was it Satan who got paid off? Is God paying himself? What is going on here? So one of the things with these metaphors, even though they're biblical, is they don't grasp the whole picture on the one hand. If you make it the whole picture, you get in trouble in a hurry. At the same time, they can easily be twisted in a direction that's very dark. So the challenge, you know, I see us all wrestling here. We're all struggling to express things. We are in territory that Ellen White says will be the science and song of the redeemed throughout eternity, that the meaning of the cross is something that will never be exhausted by an eternity of research and thought and scholarship. So we are wrestling with things that are over our pay grade, and yet because the cross is necessary, we must wrestle and understand as well as we can. Jay. You indicated that this metaphor is grounded in the Exodus. And first of all, you know a lot more about it than I do, but I also connect this to the redemption price metaphor, you know, Boaz redeeming Ruth. And in that sense, I know it certainly doesn't solve all of the issues, like you're saying, but to me, the price arises from need rather than from somebody imposing a bill, if you will. So, in other words, Ruth was a widow faced with poverty without heirs in a foreign land. And so the price paid for her redemption was perhaps in that sense, not really to anyone, but it simply was a restitution for her great need. And I don't know whether that offers any useful consideration or not. Well, I think it's very useful. Is the Ruth story in Jesus' mind when he talks about ransom and so on? Probably not. I think the Exodus story is the bigger picture, but a fun research project you might want to try is just take the word redeem and redemption and ransom, etc., and go through a concordance and see how it is used. I think a lot of the references go back to the Exodus story, but certainly it's there in the Ruth and Boaz story. And here's the fascinating thing. In ancient marriage ceremonies, the bride price, that came from the husband to the father of the bride as sort of a collateral that he would treat her well, (laughs) and that if he treated her well and stuff, they would inherit that money back. So here, Boaz was very much within the Hebrew tradition of ransoming her. So there was a need. How would that apply to the cross? How are you applying that to the cross, Jay? In the sense, it's a compensation for a need that exists. So rather than there being a punitive invoice, if you will, that needs to be paid. There's a departure from the ideal and it's self-imposed and there's no way out. And so the price is a redemption price. It restores something that has been lost rather than representing at least directly a debt that needed to be paid somehow. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate those thoughts. Larry? As you and a few others here know, I am, I'm going to say, even violently opposed to the forensic model. I'm not just casually opposed. With that, and tying it back to the Exodus, this may be part of the place to introduce Ellen White's comments, and I don't have my copy of Desire of Ages with me, 
But where she mentions, I think it begins on page 113 or 137. I'll get it posted in a minute. But the cost was the fact that Christ could have failed and what that would have implied. So the ransom then is paid because no money changed hands. I'm in trouble. You're leaving the safety of Beaumont and coming into central LA where I'm in trouble. And it's late on a Saturday afternoon and nobody that should be working and the gang violence is going to be pretty bad shortly. So you're coming in to rescue me. There is a cost associated to you for what you are doing that involves no money, no payment of anything to anybody. And to compound matters, I went there on my own free will, chose to do the actions that got me there. You're choosing to come rescue me on one of the most violent possible days to do so. So in viewing it in that light... I think what I really take from what you're saying is the idea that ransom implies a cost but nowhere in the Bible does it say who it was paid to. So ransom as an idea is used here. It isn't talking about a transaction necessarily. I think that's an important point that you're making. What I think we take from this ransom idea is that the atonement was costly to God. Why it was costly, maybe we don't fully understand, but it was very costly to God. Salvation costs us nothing, but it cost him everything. And that God's love was willing to pay an enormous price to rescue us, a greater price than driving from Beaumont to L.A. and dodging a couple bullets <laughs> or whatever else might be thrown our direction. So, yeah, the positive in the ransom idea, I think, is the idea that it expresses the value God places upon us. And you can take it in some dark directions, so let's not overplay the metaphor, as we're all saying, but it does express something beautiful about God, the tremendous value he places on us and the price he was willing to pay within himself. And Graham Maxwell likes to use the analogy of Roger Bannister, who was a runner, Olympic runner, who broke the four-minute mile, and he collapsed over the finish line when he did that. It cost him hugely to achieve that result. He didn't pay that to somebody else, but still there was a cost involved. Iris. I like that idea earlier to play with the Ruth story. For many, Ruth may have just been this unempowered migrant woman that came into the country and suffered a meager existence trying to make ends meet for herself and Naomi. And the beauty of Boaz he looked at this woman as a quality woman. He saw the beauty in her, her potential, a virtuous woman, a woman who showed love and commitment to her mother-in-law, a person who was not empowered to help herself, who was vulnerable for her rights to be violated, for her to just be without any type of male protection in a society where you really needed that. And Boaz becomes that savior figure paying the ransom. And as a result, she becomes his wife. And that metaphor of a marital relationship is exactly the metaphor that the New Testament gives us for the relationship between Christ and the church, the bride. I think that, that metaphor also transports absolute trust. It's a safe relationship. It's a relationship that is geared towards long-term, towards eternity. It's a relationship that allows the vulnerable part, Ruth, the ransom part, the church, to grow and to reach her full potential. I think it is really something very beautiful when we think about it, stimulated or inspired by that story. Mm. Feels like we've squeezed quite a bit of juice out of this ransom metaphor. So that's excellent. Appreciate this discussion. Let's go on to the perhaps most controversial one, and yet one that we cannot avoid because of how the Bible uses it. And that is found in Romans 3, 25 and 26, and Hebrews 9, 5. And I call this hilasterion. There's no English equivalent that people can particularly agree on. They try different words. All of them may do more harm than good. But what you need to know is that 
When the Hebrew in the Old Testament talks about atonement, it is kipper, the Hebrew word kipper, which basically means a covering. And so you have those dozens of times in the Old Testament when a sacrifice is made to cover, to atone for somebody. All right. In the Greek Old Testament, kipper is almost always translated with the verb form from hilasterian, hilaskomai, and similar things. So the Greek has a word for covering, which is hilasterian, but Paul doesn't use it in Romans 5 in 2 Corinthians 5, in Ephesians 2. There, the equivalent for atonement is reconciliation, which is where the at-one-ment came from. So, the actual Greek word that corresponds to atonement is hilasterion, and it appears only twice in the New Testament. We'll look at both of those. They're from different writers. We'll look at both of them and try to make sense of this thing. First Hebrews 9, 5. And when I say different writer, obviously, most English Bibles say Hebrews is the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. I think most scholars, even conservative scholars, put at least a big question mark on that. And the author is not mentioned in the book itself. So that's a traditional attestation. The style is so different from Paul. It's jarring if you read the Greek. If Paul did write it, or perhaps it was written for him by somebody else, we don't toss that completely out. But it seems to be a different way of thinking than uh, most of Paul's letters. So I save this one as two authors here in the New Testament because you have to deal with it. The fact that the Greek Old Testament uses this for atonement, you got to deal with it in one form or another. So let's see how it's dealt with in these two texts. Hebrews 9, 5. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak now in detail. All right, so here, he uses this word hilasterion for the mercy seat, and that is the covering of the ark. All right, so there you get the covering idea. There was a lid over the ark, and then above that, you had the two angels and the glory of God. So there was a covering between the actual symbol of God's presence and the ark itself containing the Ten Commandments and other things. So this mercy seat idea, which came from Luther, that this covering stands between God and the sinner. So the idea of a covering is there's a certain inadequacy on our part to actually be in the presence of God, and that this hilasterion will somehow make it possible for us to be connected with God. Uh, Romans 3.25 is the other place where this word is used. Whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. Okay, we're going to come to the latter part of this, but let's first look at the beginning of verse 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. That's an interesting translation. It's a neutral translation. Unfortunately, it doesn't really tell us anything. It doesn't explain anything. It's a sacrifice of atonement. Okay, but what does that mean? That is the way that hilasterion is sometimes translated. The problem with hilasterion and why it's become controversial is that in the pagan Greek world, hilasterion is normally used for propitiation. It is used for turning away someone's anger with a gift. So somebody's mad at you, you give them a hilasterion to get them back on your side. It means to cause someone to be favorably inclined. The problem, of course, biblically, is that God is not such a vindictive deity. God doesn't need to be persuaded to be on our side. The Bible is crystal clear with that. The texts we read, 2 Corinthians 5, Romans 5, etc., are, are all clear. God did not have to be persuaded to provide the atonement. The atonement was something that he provided freely out of his love for us. So the pagan view often bleeds into interpretation. This happened through the Christian history. Anselm, for example, is the most famous one 
who took this concept, as I think Larry said earlier, this was taken to an extreme that many feel has been very damaging. But in Christian usage, the meaning of hilasterion is to remove an impediment to relationship. So that brings it, I think, a little closer to what we've already seen. Hebrews 2 verse 17, for example, uses a form of hilasterion, a verbal form, which can maybe help us get a window into the meaning. Hebrews 2.17. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Right. So there again, you have that translation, sacrifice of atonement, but it's a verb. That's why he might make atonement or might make a sacrifice. It's a verbal form. So it's basically saying, in order that he might, what? For the sins of the people. And then there's this word, this concept. That's why I said there's really no English equivalent that people have come up with to make it plain. And that's why the translators often go for this neutral sacrifice of atonement. So it has implications of paying a penalty for a crime, has implications of eliminating obstacles to a relationship. Understanding it in that way, God took upon himself the penalty of sin. That's what Christ did at the cross. He made him to be sin for us. He took upon himself the consequences of our sin so that we would not have to bear those. Christ took away any impediments to our relationship with God. Of course, the question throughout history is, who's being placated here? Who's the impediment? And some have said, God. And that was Anselm seems to be saying, God is the impediment. And through Christ now, the impediment is taken away, and we have a chance at salvation. Obviously, that interpretation is very problematic from a biblical perspective. What I think we can take from this Hilasterion idea is that whatever obstacle was there, God dealt with it while we were still sinners, so that when we come into contact with the atonement, it is God freely offering something. The obstacle is gone. The obstacle has been cared for. God comes to us with no obstacles in the way. And then verse 25 and 26 clarify further. We'll come back to them later, but let's just look at them right now in this context. It gives us maybe a hint of how God removes that obstacle. Romans 3, 25 and 26, once more. Whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. All right, so here the purpose of this hilasterion is not to buy us back or buy God off or to change God's mind. The purpose is a demonstration. It is to show God's righteousness, to show that God is acting rightly. So in the context, some of the speculations regarding hilasterion need to be taken with great caution. Jay. Thank you. I'm really enjoying the discussion and learning a lot, hopefully, by the grace of God. It seems to me that the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, naturally, and think about physical law, naturally destroys sin. So if you think about like deadly viruses, that God has such healing virtue, that anything that would cause death that comes into his presence is instantly destroyed. And this is not because God is angry with Adam and Eve, but his holiness indeed would have destroyed them when they made the choice that they did. But he immediately stepped in and preserved their lives. In other words, there's a sense in which when God said, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. I realized the concept of day is controversial. Dying, you will die. So people have interpreted that as, you know, well, you'll begin to die. That doesn't mean that you will actually die that day. 
Well, I think that what he was saying is that if you choose to separate from me, the only source of life, that they would have died, but that God and his mercy and grace based on what Christ would do actually chose to preserve their lives, even due to the bad choice they made. And so this mercy seat, the helisterion, is protection from a natural ceasing to exist because of our being united with sin. And it's not because God is mad at us. It's his natural holiness destroys anything that's deadly. But he stepped in to provide the plan of redemption to cleanse us of sin so that we could again be restored to intimacy with him. Well, I sense you struggling to express that and we're in some very deep territory, but I think that was a very, very helpful way of approaching it. Daniel? I think in all this discussion, we need to distinguish between what the text says and how the text was understood throughout the centuries of Christian era. And the moment we start confusing those two, we get into mishmash, you know, we get into a, a mess because there is no clear indication that, for example, in the Old Testament, the reference to the sacrifice was understood as referring to the Messiah. The New Testament says that God is now accomplishing a new and better exodus and just as he brought his children out of slavery, Israel out of Egypt, now he's even bringing his children from a darker and bigger and more significant slavery. And only after the cross, the Isaiah 53 and the Passover and all these things are put together. And then comes the early centuries where the preoccupation with guilt, you can still see that in the difference between the medieval Catholic understanding and the Orthodox understanding and the Protestant or evangelical understanding, how preoccupation with our guilt comes with a response to that, the forensic model, etc. But let's distinguish that God can use any crutches that help us to bring him closer to him. The problem is once you start insisting that this is the reality, this is not just a model of interpretation, or this is the only true way of looking at things and measuring it as a benchmark of orthodoxy. You know, remember when John Stott announced that he does not believe in eternally burning hell, the bombshell it created in evangelical circles because suddenly people felt that if you don't believe in eternally burning hell, are you still an evangelical? Because that was a measuring benchmark of orthodoxy. And so something similar because of the fundamentalist crisis in 1920s happened with the rejection of forensic substitutionary atonement happens still today that people feel that, oh, we are on a shaky ground here and that we even need to aggressively oppose one or the other one. And once again, you create a polarization that we are fighting them and they are fighting us. Well, we are just sincerely trying to understand what is it that the text says? What is God trying to teach them? What is he trying to teach us in 2021? And is the understanding of church fathers, of medieval reformers, or 19th century Adventist pioneers the last word that can be said on this context or in this matter? And of course not, because the Holy Spirit still works today and God leads us to express in words and metaphors and models of interpretation how we understand that God accomplished on our behalf and he's still doing it today for us. And you point out beautifully, Daniel, that so often when you do careful exegesis of these texts, they often say less than we would like them to say. And we often see more in them than we should. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I like also what you were saying, that we often look at these texts through the filters of these 2,000 years of theological understanding. And not only that, but you also have the Greco-Roman world, which influenced that later Christian understanding, having different meanings for these same words than what is evident in Scripture. So there are minefields here. And again, this is one of those subjects where we might easily say, this is too difficult, let's just pass it on. Yet when Jesus said it is necessary, he is appealing to us to try. And I think of the ways in which Ellen White has often said that the greatest exercise toward mental power 
and mental intellectual understanding is to study the cross. <laughs> Every comment that's being made, you can feel there's a stretching, there's a struggling. We're in over our heads, but it's that very kind of thing that builds mental resilience. So thank you for joining us on that journey today. Sherry. I think it broadens it even more when we think about the angels having needed it, that his death is what secured the angels as well. Well, if the angels have been struggling with it, we certainly would expect that to be the case for us as well. Yes. Uh, thank you for sharing that too. All right. There's five more models to look at, but this seems to be a good stepping off point. If we took on another one, we might be here another hour, and then some of us would neither sleep nor eat when they should. So <laughs> anyway, we will draw a close at this point and continue in the next portion, the third portion of this study on why Jesus had to die. Let's pray as we close. Lord, I thank you for your goodness to us that though it was impossible for us to fully understand all the things that we are discussing today, Nevertheless, you have provided enough for us to gain a certain sense of understanding, enough for us to be saved, enough for us to be clear about who you are. We thank you for that gift and pray that you would continue to be with us as we continue to study for Jesus' sake. Amen.